Without much further ado, I'd like to introduce to you Mike Beam, Secretary of Ag. Mike Beam with the Kansas Department of Agriculture. So, Mike. How's everybody doing? Well, it's quite a privilege to uh, have a chance to visit with you, uh, kind of as a kickoff, I guess. Uh, one of the, I must confess that there are people in this room, most of you that know far more about uh, soil health and regenerative ag than I, but uh, I just was going to make a few comments. Because of the role that I play in, I always like to brag about Kansas and Kansas agriculture. So you'll have to, to bear with me a little bit uh, with, with that. But I want to talk about the significance of agriculture in Kansas. One of our big resource challenges that I think all of you are aware of, uh, maybe some of the opportunities uh, in the climate resilience arena and uh, how that affects the food supply for the future. <clears throat> so many people think of Kansas uh, as pretty commonly thinking of as, as wheat, the wheat state. Uh, but, you know, we also have our traditional commodities that you see and many of you probably are involved with. Um, but uh, other areas that we consider agriculture would be our landscape, horticulture, Pet food, I'll mention that here a little bit later. Uh, it's becoming a big part of agriculture and, of course, our uh, livestock animal food processing. But we have about 46 million acres uh, of land uh, in Kansas. It's uh, U.S. Census says they call it uh, farmland uh, and about uh, 59,000 farms. And the average, of course, is skewed uh, from east to west in the size of those farms. But what I like to tell people in, in eastern part of the state, uh, in non-ag state, is 14% of the workforce in Kansas comes from the agriculture sectors. So uh, we are an ag state, uh, and we have a big contribution to the economic well-being of Kansas. One of the things I enjoy, I've always enjoyed in my career, when it comes to agriculture production, it is still family-oriented. They look differently, they're, they're organized uh, you know, as corporations, LLCs, but the census bears the fact that it's still predominantly uh, family-owned farms and ranches, uh, particularly in this state. So of all the acres, we have about 21 million that's farmed. Uh, we also have 14 million acres of grazing lands uh, that uh, make up our farmland, as USDA calls it. So the top five ag products uh, that are grown, the volume grown would be cattle and calves, wheat, corn, sorghum, and soybeans. Those are the common uh, commodities sectors of the Kansas agriculture. But in Kansas, uh, our ag economist uh, notes that the state's economy is, around, is built around 536 sectors. 73 of them we consider our agriculture. So we have some of those sectors I mentioned earlier, food, food processing, and they, those 73 have a direct contribution to the state's economy of, of over $53 billion. The direct, indirect, and induced, it comes up to $76 billion. And this might surprise you on some of these, but if you look at the volume the dollar impact to the state, number one is beef cattle, uh, almost $9 billion. Animal slaughtering, uh, that doesn't include poultry. We have very minimal poultry manu uh, processing. Third is grain farming. Fourth is further processing of meat. And this is the one that may surprise you, but the one that continues to grow, and that's dog and cat food manufacturing. Like I said earlier, it's becoming a larger sector, and of course it's using byproducts uh, and adding value to the products that come from our uh, common ag sectors, other common ag sectors. We're first in grain, uh, in grain sorghum. Uh, we are first in winter wheat. We rank second in sorghum for, for silage, third in cattle, and fourth in sunflower production. So if you take a look in the, of the top 10 rankings, uh, by various commodities, we have, I think, about 15 of those categories. So we're very diverse, 
uh, but yet a very big player in agriculture. So this is the resource I just wanted to mention. Uh, again, I don't think this will surprise you, but it's becoming more and more uh, a topic of conversation, not just uh, within our agency or other agencies of the state, but when I go to meetings, especially this summer with the drought, this was what was talked about. So this is a map that I like to, to use. As you'll see, it's interacting. So we started in 1996, and this is showing the change in the feet of groundwater. So the darker that is, the more we've pulled from the aquifer, or what's left. There's a lot less left in the darker color. So you see in 96, there was a lot of blue, which means we only uh, dropped the, the level about five to 10 feet. But as you get into that darker uh, colors, you'll see that it goes as much as over 60 feet of drop in our High Plains aquifer. And that, of course, uh, is quite concerning to me when I think about the impact the aquifer has on agriculture, the communities that support agriculture, uh, and the state's economy. This is a different map of the aquifer. This is uh, static, but this tells you how many years are estimated to be left of use of the High Plains Aquifer by geographic area of the state. And some of those um, are pretty, the darker it is means that the thickness is already at a minimum threshold for pumping. So if you, in this area, this is probably one of the, the, the most productive areas long term uh, the south central part of the state still has, uh, you know, more of a sustainable groundwater supply. As you go west and northwest, uh, you know, that changes. So that's a map that is getting a lot of play. And, and it's, it's based on some of the best data that I think any state over the High Plains Aquifer has. One thing that Kansas has done... Uh, and you know, a lot of this come from leadership, you know, like Fred Kerr was in the legislature back in the day when, you know, we set up where if you're going to, if you have a water right, you get a report every year how much you pump. We have, I think, over 450 index wells. So the same week, it's usually, I think, in January, Kansas Geological Survey goes out and takes a water level at all those wells. So we've got probably some of the best data on what's happening underground in the aquifer. And, and that's how this map was arranged. So uh, we talked about this last night. You know, the state water plans is wanting to, uh, the, the goal thus far has been to conserve and extend the life of the aquifer. Uh, I would say, though, that uh, in perhaps the last few months, there's been conversation about do we need to change that goal? Because how long is extend? We saw the map. Some places there's not much left. And well, the other thing the legislature's done over the years, oh, probably over the last 10 years, is they've created some tools that can help if locals and the communities want to step forward and use them. Uh, the middle one is mentioned in the local enhanced management area. Uh, that is applicable to groundwater management districts where they can assess, we want to reduce use of water by X percent, and the board of directors has the authority to implement that. They get approval from the chief engineer. Um, and it's been um, probably most successful in the northwest part of the state where they've entered into uh, agreements and renewed their five-year local enhanced management area. And they've actually seen a considerable uh, reduction in that decline. They're, they have a much more positive future in, in the approach that they're taking. And in many cases, they have found that they've used less than what their target was because they've been very strategic in how they use it and using some of the technology. The, the legislature also created water conservation areas. Uh, that it can be one or more water right owners who collectively agree to do uh, reduction, uh, and usually with the agreement that they have more flexibility year to year. And then the multi-year flex accounts, that's uh, if for someone with a water right, they can uh, get approval to enroll in that, and then they have five years to use a certain quantity of water. 
we're going to see a large, we expect a large number of applications for multi-year flex accounts to come in as the year ends because people who over pump their authorization in 2022, uh, that's about the only tool they have uh, without having some regulatory uh, consequences. Again, most of these are voluntary. If you're in a local enhanced management area, it's not necessarily voluntary if, if the groundwater management district is voted to move forward. So I uh, talked to uh, our chief engineer the other day and some others. And there's always better ideas, but really we have the tools to do what we need to do as far as grow, be more sustainable in our use of, of water. And of course, technology always helps with uh, the crop genetics, our patterns, the technology with soil moisture probes. The state's investing a lot uh, with, of those with cost share agreements uh, for, for this technology. And you know, there's a lot of different efforts we're trying to make uh, more focus on it with uh, the water plan, uh, the governor's water conference, which starts tomorrow. And, and you've probably heard about the water technology farms. But, I believe, I'm confident you're gonna hear more discussion and more urgency uh, that we need to do more. So this is just a, a few bullets that I put in. I think most of you are aware of this. Uh, you're believers, you know, and that's why you're here. But uh, I think that's our future is to make sure we're more resilient. Uh, using some of these practices and some of the technology that, that you've probably heard about and going to hear more about uh, at this conference. Um, broadband is a, is a part of it, having that access to data and the state's making considerable investment in making sure we have high-speed internet uh, through all parts of the, can of the state. And the one thing that I have to have faith in uh, in my career, I've always been... Um, impressed with the ability of farmers and ranchers to innovate and look for the future and plan for the next generation. So I, I believe we'll get there. We just need to, uh, to keep focused. And when the, several years ago when we started talking about uh, the carbon market and the need or desire to reduce uh, carbon output, uh, you know, I wasn't quite sure, you know, how much of this is being driven by who's in office uh, in, you know, in D.C. Uh, or other interest groups. But what I've kind of come to conclusion is you've looked at some of these corporations. You know, McDonald's is all in. We, you can argue they're not doing enough. Some may argue that they're not doing enough. You know, McDonald's has a very, very... Uh, measurable plan that they're reducing their greenhouse gas emissions. What happens, that's, that goes down to their suppliers, which goes down to their, their growers. Walmart, you know, they have um, emissions reduction plan. ADM is investing considerably with soil health grants, uh, low emission energy uh, production. Alanda Lakes has their own true carbon program where they actually have a separate entity uh, that works with producers to uh, reduce carbon output, store carbon, and potentially sell their carbon credits. General Mills you know, has a regenerative ag pilot project. And the North American Meat Institute, which is the organization represented by all your major uh, beef and pork packers, they have their own sustainability goals and are uh, working to reduce uh, emissions and have made considerable uh, reduction over the last 10 years. And then your trade organizations such as the National Corn Growers uh, put a big emphasis with research and documentation and help in, uh, in reducing greenhouse gas impacts. So I would just say that why are these people getting on board? Congress hasn't required them to do so. And I was having this conversation just this last week the reason that these companies are doing it is it's the right thing to do, but they're all consumer-based. They study consumers. They're, they're, they've made a, uh, grown huge corporations by observing, doing research, what do consumers want and need, how will they respond. They're on board with this. So we know that our customer is always right, uh, and its consumers are demanding it. 
That's why I think uh, there's going to be even more emphasis on this, regardless of the political spectrum. USDA put a bunch of money into the Climate Smart uh, grants. Several people in Kansas were recipients of that. I think there's going to be more discussion about that. But it's, I think the last count was $3 billion in grants that are going out for Climate Smart commodity uh, programs. We are, uh, Kansas Department of Ag and our Division of Conservation uh, are partnering with some of those. Uh, we are in collaboration with a couple of these, with the DeLong Company and the National Sorghum Producers. Um, but but here's what uh, here's what makes me think about the future and what scares me. So the United Nations has a food and agriculture organization, and their vision is to create a world free from hunger and malnutrition, where food and agriculture contribute to improving the living standards of all, especially the poorest, in all economically, socially, and environmentally sustainable manner. In my words, in my thought. We've got to address hunger. And what really got my attention, and, and Beth um, with Lando Lakes uh, CEO mentioned at a recent uh, presentation in Manhattan, is that we have to do nearly double production of food by the year 2050 worldwide. Or we'll, or we'll only continue to have more hunger. So I think our challenge is. Um, We've got to rise to, uh, to meet the needs of people as a, as a population grows, diet changes, uh, and increased incomes, hopefully, to, produ uh, to purchase food or produce their own. And we're doing this with less land. We'll always be, have less land. They don't make any more of it. So we've got to be very um, productive, very sustainable uh, if we're going to feed people in the world in the next 25 years. And that means lots of investment in research and development technologies and, of course, uh, her human capital. So I think, looking at this, uh, what our biggest opportunity to meet these needs and what I think all of you are gathered here before, it's all going to depend upon the health and resiliency of our soils. And I, I'm, I'm proud to be a part of this program. Uh, it, it's an honor to be here, and, I, and I'll and stay around for a little bit. I, I know I'm going to learn a lot more than I've been able to, to share with you, but I, I thank you for being here. Thank you for inviting me, and I, I guess I'd respond to any questions that you might have or challenges that, that you might have at this time. Yes, sir. So the question was, is there any research done on how we can add water back into the aquifer? I'm sure there is, uh, and I, I should have mentioned there are some projects. Uh, the one that does come to mind is the Playa Lakes Joint Venture, where there's been a lot of uh, resources, both public and private, into restoring those, uh, those wetlands. And, and, and Kansas has enrolled quite a few acres. So that, that's one small way, I think. And maybe it would be more than small, but that's one effort. And I'm, I'm sure it's backed by you know, some scientific research. But we probably need to look at that some more. And maybe And the conversation we had last night is if we get you know, the soil health to where we know it needs to be, maybe that's one of the, the biggest ways we can do it. Uh, but we that's a good idea. We should make sure we focus some of the research on that Somebody else had a hand up Yes, okay um, <clears throat> So I think that is the critical question. How do we raise the level in aquifers because We're talking about not sustaining or stopping something from, you know, getting worse, but regenerative, how do we make things better? So raising the aquifers should be your top priority. Um, also, I, um, I'm really, really happy you're here. Uh, I feel as Secretary of Agriculture, you have a responsibility to learn more about what this group is doing. Um, it is the future. It should be, you know, broadcast loud and clear to everyone. Um, I also feel like half of your presentation 
um, is still addressing a false paradigm. Uh, I think we've moved on. Uh, if I look at all of my conventional farming neighbors, they're all dying of cancer. Um, this is urgent. We, we cannot wait, you know. The United Nations, most of their uh, programs are falling short of, of achieving any, any of the goals. Uh, so we have to start asking different questions and addressing, you know, the real need because we don't need to produce more food. We need to produce better food um, and, and educate the public that maybe all that corn that's grown for high corn, hard corn, fructose, whatever it's called, um, that has to stop. Uh, so, you know, I feel like we have a responsibility to start educating all of the people in, you know, your area, you going out and, and um, Again, telling people in Congress uh, that we have to start asking different questions. So, you know, I'm, I'm, again, I don't have like a big question, but I feel like resources, you say you have tools, you have the resources. I think it's top priority that we start with the water and say, and, and then how do you increase the water? Well, maybe if the soils are better, the water table will rise. So the soil is the answer and, and water. Is, so I hope you will prioritize that. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. And we're doing a panel as a follow up okay. too. And so we'll have some really great, uh, I think maybe some possible solutions to that. So I appreciate the presentation for sure. Um, maybe a different take. There's a lot of talk about carbon scoring all of our practices at the farm level. Is there an opportunity to tie a water score to that? Because I, I think you have a really innovative group in this room, but within production agriculture, peer groups work well. These lemas have worked well because people are learning from their neighbors and the competitive nature of agriculture is what allows us to innovate faster than anybody else in the world. So I don't know if instead of a top-down approach, maybe an integrated approach that says, hey, can we create a, a water score around these things that maybe is traded? Not that I want to go to cap and trade, but it's much the way these carbon markets are developing. Can we do the same thing around water use? And I know there's an economic use that's put out by your office annually, but any thought on something like that? I think there's an opportunity to do that. Part of these um, carbon, uh, these grants that I mentioned, is has a research element and a lot of different partners none of the none of the proposals that were, were awarded money had fewer than what 10 15 collaborate collaborators so and some of those collaborators are producers so i think there is going to be an opportunity and, and those are the kind of uh, questions and input that i think we need to to challenge because those grants are designed to get more data develop other ideas not just show how to do it better. You're gonna get a chance to meet uh, Andy Lyon, our, who's in our agency and is the division director of our uh, division of conservation on this panel this afternoon. So he's, he's set up to bail me out if I, if I mess up. <laughs> Somebody else? Uh, thank yeah, you for your yes. time this morning. Yes. Um, I saw it interesting that pet food is making a pretty big impact in Kansas agriculture, but who stands to be impacted the most from a producer standpoint? From pet food? Yeah, like are your, are your grain farmers or your meat producers, who's, who's being impacted the most? Well, from, from the protein side, from the meat side, any time that you add value to an animal, uh, you know, like exports provide a considerable value to that animal, pharmaceutical aspects of an animal. So if there's higher value products from the animal that can be merchandised through pet food, and this is, what's growing is not uh, the pet food at the big box stores, it's, it's the high end pet food. And I, I'm, continually amazed at where our society puts an emphasis on pets now today and and this food we're having plants built that have are doing 
human food quality pet food where it meets all the standards for human food. So I think that any time you add value uh, to, to the, the raw commodities, people may not see, producers may not see that benefit, but, but it, it's there. Especially right now with pet food as being, it is pretty competitive. There's some large players in, in this space, but uh, uh, they're pretty competitive. Thanks. Yes. Any other questions? Oh. Thank you. I can't see your name. Okay. Yeah, um, my name is Margit. I'm with K State Extension. So oh, yes. I'm glad to be here. I'm an ag agent up in the Northeast. Um, so I think that uh, one of the other questions raised a question about uh, focusing on retaining water. So if 1% of organic matter in the soil can hold 16,500 gallons of water, we absolutely, it's incumbent that we put our focus on not just you know, the soil life, but the organic matter of the soil. It is a soil sponge. And one of the failures of our high tillage agriculture is the destruction of that organic matter. And that's where the emphasis has to be put for grass-based systems that will regenerate that water holding capacity. So I think that you know one of the, the challenges is the egg in the hen problem now that we're facing in these dryland agriculture systems is that you know we can't get the grasslands reestablished, but by using products like prairie food or stimulating the biological life that will then stimulate the plants to produce more carbon into the soil, we can rebuild. It's absolutely possible. And I think that uh, the grazing systems that we have to recognize by intensive rotational grazing, you increase the, the carrying capacity of the land by you know, threefold, fivefold sometimes. So getting more focused on intensifying our grazing, intensifying our stocking rate to in, in concentrated areas uh, it's it's all there. It's waiting to happen. That's why the buffalo were so highly successful on these grasslands. So one of the, the, the key leaders in the world is Alan Savory with his holistic management model that um, I think as farmers are bridging the gap with looking for more sustainable systems, it's grasslands that will generate um, more prosperity on the land in, in this area, maybe less row crop out west and more cattle. <laughs> Ideally. <laughs> so some of you may know that most of my career has been working on the livestock side and, and considerable emphasis on the conserving of our grasslands. So I'm with you on that. The one thing we have to realize is that there's a lot of people in agriculture who really don't care to have livestock. There are those who have livestock that really don't care that much about tilling the land. So I think, I mean, it's economics, it's landowner rights, but if we have the research and if we have the peer-to-peer -peer and we have the knowledge where you can share, there's other ways to do it. That's going to make the biggest emphasis, I believe. I mean, we can't force people to go that way, but we, maybe we can show them the way. Backed with the economics. And thank you for being here with K-State Research and Extension. I appreciate that. Thank you. Rob's got something. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Mike, and and really thank you for being here as as well. And one of the one of the questions that was raised about tying carbon to the water is an excellent excellent question. And uh, in the several times that I've been visiting uh, your team and others at the at the state house here in Kansas, uh, that question has come up. And and the the finest question actually came from from Paul Hughes, who's uh, at the at the Commerce Department. And his his question was, how would you design a water car a water program that would have credits available? so that instead of uh, regulating and, and trying to conserve and extend, we could create an environment where there was incentives for people to utilize less water 
earn money from that, and those that were in need of water at the time could buy those credits and utilize, utilize those waters. I, I think those are the right questions that are being, being asked by the folks at the State Department. I think the real challenge here is for the State Department, instead of taking a follow and, follow and wait and see attitude, is to take a more leadership role in let's make this regenerative and expanding our ability to leverage our resources and bring them back to, back to the point where they can supply what's needed in the world. And uh, I applaud you on, on the direction that, that, that you guys are going, but I encourage you to take quicker steps and support more local businesses. Uh, Prairie Food has been fortunate. We received a million dollars of the USDA uh, grant by joining with Jivo, who is, who is making uh, sustainable aviation fuels from ethanol. Um, those are opportunities going forward that we need to realize in the state of Kansas, not just in South Dakota and other places. And I, I encourage you to, to pick up that flag and wave it hard and, and go a little out on the limb uh, to, to bring Kansas to the forefront of this, of this opportunity to change our ways. And thank you again for being here. We really appreciate it. Thank you, and I'm going to count on you to help me along the way. <laughs> I am here. <laughs>